Hello and welcome to EV Review Ireland. We are on day 22 of my 30 day challenge. And as I keep mentioning, it's probably a challenge for you to watch all of these videos, but I'm trying to mix up the variety and trying to make them interested. And tonight we are joined by Dr. Ewan McTurk, who you may or may not know of, but Dr. Ewan is uh, the head behind, he's an electrochemist, but he's the head behind Plug Life Television on YouTube. And if you're into batteries and all of that thing, and the last video that uh, you put out, Ewan, I sent on to my brother who is a Renault driver, and it was the relationship between the Renault Capture and the Renault Zoe, and it blew his mind. So thank you so much for that. So I highly recommend that channel. Four and a half thousand subscribers and well worked. Uh, lots of interesting content, much more research than I do on my channel. But the reason that we've got Dr. Ewan on this evening is to talk about, as the thumbnail has suggested, WLTP and what is it. But uh, uh, Ewan, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Well, thank you, Derek. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Um, I think you've you've pretty much uh, covered me. So yeah, I am an electrochemist by trade. Um, I've spent the last 10, 11 years now um, working on next generation battery chemistries such as lithium air, a breathing battery that's uh, still not commercially ready yet, but maybe slightly closer to it, courtesy of my, my efforts, who knows. But um, after that, I, I started working on commercial lithium ion cells, specifically the cylindrical cells out of Tesla's, um, opening them up, sticking things in them, reference electrodes, temperature sensors, etc., sticking them back together and getting them to undergo some pretty heavy duty drive cycles and pretend that nothing had happened to them. And that allowed us to see exactly what was going on inside the cell, inside this black box system that you you don't have too much information about really. Um, and we, we knew exactly what was going on inside those cells. We knew just how hard we could push them and when they would start to fail. Um, so having done that and then built up a, a battery lab in, in Edinburgh, I founded uh, Plug Life Consulting, uh, my consultancy off the back of my, uh, my humble little side project, Plug Life Television, my YouTube channel, uh, which I'd been building for a couple of years prior to that, which seemed to be gaining a surprising amount of traction given that uh, it was all through word of mouth, you know, people following it and things. So thank you to everyone who has... Uh, seemingly found it useful and, and pleasantly surprised. Brilliant. Uh, we have you on this evening to talk about WLTP. So whether you are an EV driver, EV curious, you own an EV, you will have heard of these four letters. Uh, and when I was backing over talk to, doc, talking to you and regarding this subject, topic matter, subject, um, you and said to me, Derek, listen, I'm not an expert in WLTP by any means. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure the people that run these WLTP tests are experts themselves because of the discrepancy that we perceive as EV drivers. So I know that you've done some more in-depth research, well, in-depth, some more research on it, Ewan. Uh, what have you come back to us with? I have, yeah, yeah. I can I can now see why uh, we call WLTP within the EV world with luck theoretically possible. Um, so to, to give you a bit of background, first of all, on what exactly WLTP is, um, it's, it's basically a test that is performed to gather the fuel economy of a petrol, diesel or electric car. Um, it tries to mimic real world driving conditions. The previous test, the NEDC from the 1980s, was all based on theoretical driving. And it was, I mean, I've seen the kind of speed versus time graph of it. It's all, it's almost digital. It's, it kind of ramps up and down very, very sharply. Whereas with the, um, you know, with the WLTP, it does look like real world driving behavior because it is based on logs from real world driving. Some of it is urban. Um, in the case of WLTP, about half of it is urban, um, just over half of it and just under half of it is non-urban. So out in the country on motorways, uh, sort of back roads, etc. cetera. Um, and what we have with the WLTP as well is we have four different um, driving cases. So you've got someone who's driving very carefully, someone who's driving moderately, um, and then high speed and extra high speed as well. So someone who's properly planting their foot to the floor. Uh, and that means that you know, it has managed to create much more realistic um, fuel economy figures for petrol and diesel and electric cars uh, than NEDC did, which massively overpromised. It would say that the likes of a uh, 
uh, a Nissan Leaf, um, I believe it would say that the the 30 kilowatt hour one would do close to something like 140, 150 miles per charge, whatever that is. Divide by five, multiply by eight, and you'll get it in the sensible unit of kilometres, which unfortunately my British imperialist mind is, is, is stuck using miles at the moment. But um, yeah, the yeah the, the the disadvantage of course is that you ended up with uh, vehicles being oversold on on the promise but quite a lot of dealers would say realistically the range is going to be nearer 110 or 120 for for that particular leaf that i mentioned for example um so you know we almost had to apologize for this official test that they were mandated to to stick the results of onto the vehicle when selling it um WLTP has has come a long way to uh, to rectifying that kind of embarrassment um, and and being somewhat more truthful. Uh, being even though it is lab based, it's at least a hybrid with real world information, uh, but it's still not quite there. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one is that the average speed at which the test is conducted is about 48 kilometers an hour. That's roughly 30 miles an hour. Um, so that's, you know, town centre driving. And obviously that's an average, fair enough. But the people who tend to complain about the range that they're getting from their electric vehicle versus the WLTP figure are the ones who are booting their, you know, booting the throttle on the motorway, um, chewing up motorway miles and go in a headwind, you know, <laughs> with the, with the, with the know, wind, rain with the rain. Down, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they go, my car's not got a decent enough range on it. It isn't doing nothing. It's because you have absolutely sapped the, um, you know, the power when you've been blasting it. Because of course, the, the, the faster you drive, um, it's not a linear increase in the amount of power that's required. It's almost exponential. You know, it increases the rate at which you need to increase the power to go a certain number of kilometers an hour faster increases itself. So it, as I say, it does become even more strenuous on the vehicle. So the slower you drive, um, the more miles you'll get out of your vehicle, unsurprisingly. Similarly with petrol and diesel cars. But because electric cars um, started off with uh, smaller batteries, comparatively limited range, even though we're now looking at you know, realistically, 300 to 400 kilometers um, out of, of the latest kind of electric vehicle battery packs, including your sort of cheaper family runabout options. Um, despite that, we're coming from that legacy thinking, I suppose, of, um, you know, you have this very clear indication on the dashboard of how much mileage or, or kilometrage is left, um, and therefore being a bit more conscious of it, a bit more aware of it than you were when it was a simple, skiddly little fuel gauge that just went full, half empty. You know, it, it gives you more information and you, you start to worry more about the, the information that you have when you're presented with it. So electric vehicles in their attempts to placate you and, and, and you know make sure that you don't run out of charge, make sure you know exactly how much range you have left, also mean that uh, you know, if you are driving faster, if the weather is colder, etc., you become more conscious of a, of a reduction in range. But where does WLTP come into this? Well, what we have is we have a test that is performed in a laboratory at about 23 degrees C, and that is the standard temperature at which WLTP is run. So even if you are driving 30 miles an hour, 48 kilometers an hour, um, as per the average speed of that WLTP test, if it's quite cold weather, you know, if you're down into the mid-teens, into the, the single digits or even sub-zero degree C, then of course you are going to see a reduction in range because as temperature decreases, the internal resistance of the battery increases and the subsequent reduction in range is, is, is seen, uh, particularly in, in the winter months. And of course, um, you know, our, Ireland and uh, and certainly Scotland are, are known to be occasionally chilly places um you know mm -hmm. it do, we, we do have temperatures above 23 degrees c we enjoy them a few days a year but um absolutely the rest of the time wltp is somewhat um somewhat toasty by comparison for for ambient temperature for us so that is part of the reason that you will not see that range being realized um and also yeah you you will have a mixed driving on a, on a typical day but if you have a long motorway journey then of course the heavy usage the high speed element of that wltp test has not been split out from it you don't mm. have a separate figure um if you go to the likes of evdatabase.uk they've done a fantastic job of giving real world range at different temperatures and at different speeds motorway or city center driving 
Um, so they've actually tried their best to split this out, and it does make it that much more realistic. Um, so yeah, they've they've done a much better job than, than WLTP has. But as a as a starting point to improve on NEDC, it's it's definitely better. NEDC, not even demonstrably close. Um, <laughs> oh. And you know, w, <laughs> WLTP. WLTP. Uh, for somebody that's been ten minutes into this recording now, um, what does the actual WLTP stand for? Worldwide. Worldwide light, light vehicle uh, test profile. Actually, is 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 one of these ones where they've only used a certain number of letters. That is, it, it could have been so much longer. I believe it's worldwide harmonized yes. um, light vehicle light testing vehicle. platform. Yeah, harmonized light, light vehicle platform. testing procedure. Sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose it makes sense because sometimes you get a WLTP and you'll do more than it and you'll be excited with yourself because you, as you're saying, it's a warmer day, you're doing only urban driving and it hasn't got that uh, harder hitting motorway stuff. And you're like, this car is doing phenomenally well versus the the uh, the sales rep that's on the motorway up and down all the time. And he, she, or they just aren't using the urban side of it at all. Might be in a colder temperature. Uh, Ewan, thank you so much for looking into that. Do you think that this is going to be perfected do you think there's going to be a different standard brought in or will it be the likes of the EV database, which I'm a big fan of as well and will recommend people go towards when they're thinking about purchasing a vehicle, the way that they've split it out and people get an understanding then cold motorway, warm urban and the gap that's in between. Where do you think that we're going to go from here? Um, the ideal situation is the EV database route where you do have okay. a real world range for continuous driving at a particular in a particular environment and on a particular type of road, which gives you the, the real world indication of, well, if I'm driving around town all day, I'll get 400 kilometers. If I'm on the motorway all day, I'll get 300 kilometers per charge. Um, that sort of idea. Whether uh, the automotive uh, regulatory powers that be end up doing that or not is a different matter. So it will be up to the likes of EV database and your car reviewers to, to fill the gap. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because typically WLTP um, it gets it considerably more right than NEDC did. I reckon mm. that NEDC, to get the real world, I mean, the real world range of a car would be about 70% of what NEDC told you. Whereas WLTP, the real world range is probably nearer 90%. Although I've seen okay. some cases where WLTP, strangely, has underestimated it slightly. Mm. Again, it depends on the strength of the regen. It depends on the road conditions, etc. Um but uh, I think that if you if you want to be absolutely sure about the, the typical you know, real world range of your vehicle for mixed driving, um, EV database does a good job, as does EPA, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, where there's obviously a lot more freeway driving. Um, so mm -hmm. therefore, the, the motorway section of that an, you know, analytical procedure is greater. And as a result, the range of electric vehicles um, that have been tested by EPA tend to be underestimated by, I would say, 10, 20 kilometers in, in, in a typical case. So, um, you know, EPA is slightly pessimistic, but that means that everything on top of that is a bonus to you as the driver. EPA, entirely plausible analysis. <laughs> You've all the acronyms worked out. Um, have you then also used, and thank you so much, this is really fascinating. Have you then also used a better route planner where you can put in your battery size, your car make, the temperature outside and that will give you a wondering is that their own programming or is it elements of WLTP that they're bringing into it as well? That is a great question because I've never used a better route planner. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I've, I've also never even used, shockingly, the, the Scottish developed WhatsApp, which is brilliant. It's a similar idea. They factor in the terrain, they factor in the, the real world range of the vehicle. I believe they must be using more kind of EV database-esque mm -hmm. realistic motorway range. Um, and then they'll tell you exactly where you need to stop on that route. Uh, a better route planner, I'm, I'm assuming, is, is broadly similar in, in concept. I don't know whether they're using WLTP or if they're using EV database or proprietary data. Um, I, I wouldn't want to second guess, but uh, I do know that there are people who swear by that app. So um, I should probably investigate it. But uh, then again, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I'll, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll sit there and work it out manually. Um, but yeah, if you don't have time for that, I don't blame you. Then a better route, uh, better route map, or, or sorry, better or, route planner, or, or what's or what's what's up? What's, what's, the, what's up? What, what, what's, 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 w a t t s. Yep. What's up? Yep. Very um, good. <laughs> the marketing yeah. team were out. Um, <laughs> Certainly were. 
Thank you so much, uh, you, and that's been really, really good. And a lot of people will now have a better understanding of the WLT re-rating, may not have known about EV database, uh, and also then the WhatsApp or um, a better route planner, which are, and it's all that education piece. And your analogy at the beginning with regards to the little wiggly needle that never went in an even uh, speed either, because obviously fuel tanks were never exactly square for, for that uh, the little buoyancy aid inside it or whatever sensor they used for measuring the liquid. Um, now that we're driving EVs, we're, we're all more much more data uh, conscious, like you're saying, and, and they're trying to fill that need with regards to, we're not gonna mention range anxiety, but uh, it's been fascinating. What has been the, the most interesting bit that you've learned from the research? Um, well, I think the fact that we're we're still looking at um, a procedure that is designed around petrol and diesel vehicles. They, you know, they do have, for example, um, different points at which the gears are shifted. For example, obviously, electric vehicles don't have gears; they just have the fixed ratio. Um, so, how that translates into um, more aggressive driving is is a different matter. It must just be more emphasis on the throttle rather than higher revs. Um, so in terms of ye olde petrol and diesel technology, that's still creeping in to the, the, the WLTP to an extent, as is the thinking behind the standardised um, conditions under which the, the vehicle is tested uh, for its for its consumption, uh, which is 23 degrees C, which, OK, that's that's fine as a kind of global average, I suppose. But, but you know, for, for a, a technology like electric vehicles where batteries are somewhat sensitive to ambient temperature you will have a loss of range in in winter uh, unless the battery is is preheated then yeah you, you really do want to be factoring that in as well uh, rather than just your your sort of typical summer temperatures that you would have in in northern europe um, so i think that's the yeah the most interesting thing is that explained a lot to me why we're seeing that residual discrepancy it, it made such an improvement over any DC, but it still wasn't quite there. Could that perhaps be the reason why? I reckon possibly, yeah. Very partly, good. Partly. Um, if people want to connect with you and find out more about the great work that you're doing, is it the YouTube channel? It is, yeah. So Plug Life Television on, on YouTube. Uh, I'm also on the Twitters at 106 Ewan. Um, I'm usually available to, to answer any EV queries that you may have. Typically, if there's a technical query to do with electric vehicles, there's a good chance there's a Plug Life television episode on it. And in terms of real world range, range anxiety and things like that, you know, if you're looking to get a new electric car, that's practically non-existent range anxiety now because you are looking at well above 300, heading up towards 400 kilometers per, per charge for most mm -hmm. new electric vehicles. Um, and my own short range 24 kilowatt hour one of the original nissan leafs um i've driven that from edinburgh to the isle of sky uh, and never had any issues so the infrastructure is there and even in a vehicle that has a real world 60 to 80 mile range so that's what 120 to 160 ish mile range um you know sorry 120 to 160 kilometer ish range you know, even that was no bother on a trip which outwards to sky was about 250 miles, whatever that is in, in kilometres, divide by eight times, but oh, that's 400 odd kilometres. There we go. Um, you know, that even that was was perfectly fine. And the actually having that short range electric vehicle did add to the adventure to an extent. So there's a two part episode on the sky road trip in a short range electric vehicle. If you think you might have range anxiety um, with a new or even a secondhand electric vehicle, give that video a watch because that was a pretty extreme journey for what was ever basically just meant to be a city runabout. Um, and it just shows what is possible. And any new Very car good. that's out there that has double, triple the range just makes that an absolute walk in the park. Very good. Thank you, Ewan, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, as you mentioned there, make sure that you uh, tune in via Twitter or by YouTube to Plug Live Television. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today's episode. Hopefully you found it interesting. Uh, make sure you check out the playlist for the previous 21 episodes that I've mixed and matched in this. Uh, I've even done a coast to coast challenge here in Ireland with a Volkswagen ID3. And I said it was the smaller battery and you and the 20, 58 kilowatt hour. We won't talk about uh, the Nissan Leaf. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, remember, if you think an EV is for you, leave it to me and I'll review. Thanks for watching.